My name is Reverend Rachel Harrison, and this is the Recover Your Soul podcast, a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. I started Recover Your Soul after having profound changes in my life from my recovery of alcoholism, control addiction, and codependency. I was guided to share the tools and principles of spirituality and soul recovery to help others transform their lives as mine was transformed. For us to overcome external circumstances, we must first turn the attention to ourselves, focusing on inner change. Outer positive results in our lives will follow. As a spiritual coach, I can support you on your path to make real changes that will bring you a life of peace, happiness, connection, and abundance. Visit the website recoveryoursoul.net to book coaching sessions, read the blog, listen to some of my original music, and subscribe to receive email updates. I think of Recover Your Soul as a community. Follow us on social media and join the private Facebook group to support each other and connect. For an extra episode each week and to support this podcast, become a Patreon member or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul. Welcome back to Recover Your Soul. Thank you for spending your time with me here today. I really value that you choose to spend your time with me. I know how important that is. For my Patreon members and Apple Podcast subscribers, we have been doing a deeper dive into the book, How Al-Anon Works for Families and Friends of Alcoholics. And we have read a whole bunch of amazing things on serenity and the serenity prayer and gratitude and the power of changing your attitude. And we did forgiveness. And when I came to the section that was on personal boundaries and detachment, I knew that this had to go to all of the soul recovery community. This is foundational in our recovery from addiction to other people's feelings, our addiction to wanting to change people, our addiction to being happy if somebody else is okay, to being okay even when the world around us feels overwhelming. And our soul recovery journey is about turning the attention to ourselves stopping the victim talk, taking responsibility for our own happiness, and being brave out in the world, being resilient, having authenticity, and learning how to love ourselves deeply and let go of the things that don't work for us and let go of our past. So I'm going to read out of the book, and then as things come to me, I'll just reflect on it as as it comes. So I'm reading directly out of... How Al-Anon Works for Families and Friends of Alcoholics. This is chapter 11 on detachment, love, and forgiveness, and the first section is on personal boundaries. And it reads, Al-Anon Recovery is about reclaiming our own lives. We do this by learning to focus on ourselves, build on our strengths, and ask for and accept help with our limitations. But many of us find it difficult even to begin the self-focused process because we've lost track of the separation between ourselves and others, especially the alcoholic. And here I'm going to change it from alcoholic to addict, to dysfunction, to whatever feels appropriate. So many of us are dealing with somebody in our lives who have a drinking problem, as I had a drinking problem, but I really want you to know as a listener in soul recovery that this goes way out past just alcoholics. This is people in your lives who have dysfunction, addictive behaviors, addictive thoughts. Um, There's so many things that people are allowing themselves to be caught up in this obsessive behavior that affects us in a negative way. And this also can be from your upbringing. It can be people at work that you just wish would be different. So we use a broader scope here, although we are using the Al-Anon tools to be able to change how we think and see the world. Okay, so having said that, I'll go back to that last sentence, which is, but many of us find it difficult to even begin this self-focused process because we've lost track of the separation between ourselves and others, especially the addict or dysfunctional person in our life. Having interceded for so long on their behalf, constantly 
reacting, worrying, pleasing, covering up, smoothing over or bailing them out of the trouble, we often take upon our shoulders the responsibilities that don't rightfully belong to us. Does this sound familiar? Sure sounds familiar for me. I cannot believe how much time I spent worrying, constantly reacting, pleasing, covering up, smoothing over and bailing my family out of trouble. Um, My son and even my husband, especially the pleasing, the pleasing part, trying to be what I think he wanted me to be. So it goes on to read, the result is that we lose the sense of where we leave off and the other person begins. We have become so enmeshed with another person's life and problems that we've lost the knowledge that we are separate individuals. Is this speaking to you? I know it is speaking to me. When we ask about ourselves, we often respond about talking about them. How often do we do that? If someone asks how you're doing, what we end up doing is we talk about the other person in our life. Well, I'm still having trouble with my husband or my son is having this situation in their life or my my sister is still having this situation in their life. We don't talk about ourselves. We talk about them and what's going on with them and why their situation in life is keeping us from being who we really want to be. We perceive ourselves to be so connected that if something happens to them, it only seems right and natural for us to respond. I had a really good set of friends, and they'd been together a long time, and he had a health issue. And I remember thinking it was so interesting that when the wife talked about him and people would ask how he was doing, Her response was, we, we went to the doctor, we are having this, we, we, we. And it made sense because they were so enmeshed that for her, his health issue was her health issue. And there was never discussion about how he was doing versus how she was doing, because she could have come from a place that said, I'm feeling really scared. I'm feeling really vulnerable and nervous because this is happening to him and it makes me afraid that he's going to die. I'm terrified to lose my partner. And likewise, I'm excited that he's feeling better and it's great to see him improving. I'm so glad everything worked out okay. Those were not separated. It was as if they were one being. And I related to that. And I've always remembered that because it's helped me over the years to remind myself that I am present in the lives of my family. We are one as Team Harrison, but we are not one as humans that we leave off from each other so that I can recognize the separation. So be mindful when somebody asks you something, if you are going then and responding about the other person and not about yourself. So I love this part of the book. It goes on to read, many of us even confuse this absence of personal boundaries with love and caring, right? So we think that this being enmeshed is how we love, And maybe this is because this is how we were raised. Maybe this is because that was how your mother showed your family how to love, was to be this level of enmeshment. But it's not healthy love. Healthy love doesn't have this enmeshment in it, this loss of personal boundaries. So we can start to have the ability to look differently, to recognize that caring for somebody doesn't mean that we have to do for them or fix them or be responsible for them or worry for them, that we can love and care for them and let them have their own existence and their own life. It says, for example, from the moment the alcoholic, the other person, the addict, the dysfunctional person goes out the door, we sit immobilized, unable to do anything but think obsessively about him or her. We lose the ability to distinguish between them and ourselves until their past, their current, and their potential actions become our sole focus. 
again, can't we relate to this, that part where if they leave the house, all we're thinking about is what they're going to do. Did they do this? Did they meet with this person? Did they drink? Did they look at porn? Did they meet up with somebody that you're worried they're going to meet up with? What are the obsessions that we have about the people in their lives that are causing us to be sick ourselves? That worry, that fear, that constant obsession doesn't change anything, doesn't create a different outcome. It makes us crazy. It makes us sick. It makes us feel terrible. This is not love. This is obsession. When we cease to live our own lives because we're so preoccupied with the lives of others, our behavior is motivated by fear. Isn't this a great sentence? I mean, I have to read it again because it's so good. When we cease to live our own lives because we are so preoccupied with the lives of others, our behavior is motivated by fear. Not only is it harmful to a relationship to hover anxiously or suspiciously over a loved one day and night, it's also extremely self-destructive. I invite you to take a look at that fear. I invite you to work on what is the fear really covering up for that's underneath. The fear of abandonment, the inadequacy, the sadness, the old patterns. We use this obsessiveness over somebody else's behaviors to keep us from actually looking at ourselves, to keep us from the pain that we're afraid to feel. But the truth is, if we allow ourselves to just feel the feelings, if we allow ourselves to look deeper, to take the emphasis off of somebody else's behavior and put it on ourselves, that's where the freedom is. That's where the love begins, the love for yourself the love for your life, the letting go of these negative patterns. It goes on to say, likewise, when we cancel our own plans and stay home because we fear that they will do whatever behavior we're not wanting to do if they're left alone, we may protest and act like it's out of loving self-sacrifice for the sake of them. More likely, it's an effort to feel that we have some power over their behavior. How often have you heard me talk about the fact that we don't have control over anything other than ourselves? So we try to stop those negative behaviors, whether it's drinking or shopping or workaholism or the myriad of other addictive things that are going on. We think that we can control that. We can beg them. We can ask them to stop doing these things, but it's their own addiction They have the addict running through them. And no matter how many times you ask them to stop, don't you love me enough to not do something? What you're asking them to do is to do the impossible, to be honest, because they are completely controlled by the addiction. So we think that we have power over them. I'll use drinking, not drinking. But in the end, our anger, our frustration, our behaviors won't make them stop. It will only make us more unhappy. So it says the choice to abandon our own plans for such purpose is an act, again, of fear and not of love. Canceling plans and staying home to avoid the consequences of defying the alcoholic, the addict is another form of self-abandonment and has nothing to do with love. How many times are we walking on eggshells? How many times are we being so careful about what we say or do because we don't want to upset them? We don't want the rage. We don't want the combativeness. This is self-abandonment, that we're not doing the things that would make us feel happy, that would give us joy for the fear of a consequence that's going to come from somebody who's not well. And if we really look at whose life do you want to live, do you want to live their life or do you want to live your life? If we start to think about letting go of the fear and moving towards the love, it might mean that changes need to happen in your life. But the first changes that need to happen are within ourselves 
in our spirituality, in our self-confidence, in our love for ourself, in our self-compassion, recognizing our worthiness, recognizing our fullness, seeing the situation for what it is, not pretending that it is something that it isn't anymore, not keeping somebody from the reality of their own negative behaviors. The last paragraph of this section reads, Genuine, healthy love isn't self-destructive. It doesn't diminish us or strip us from our identities, nor does it in any way diminish those that we love. Love is nourishing. It allows each of us to be more fully ourselves. The enmeshment that characterizes an unhealthy, addictive relationship does just the opposite. That's a powerful statement. Genuine, healthy love isn't self-destructive. And it starts with the practice of you loving yourself. Genuine, healthy love of loving yourself. Of putting your needs and your health and your life first. And this is a big, big step for many people. Okay, moving on to detachment, which is the next section. And I'm going to start by reading the bookmark that started off in the episode that's called Detachment that I think most of you have heard since it's my most listened to episode of all of Recover Your Soul. And I'm just going to read it really quick before we read the section out of the book. And I love, love, love this reading and I've read it a million times and it's been a lifesaver to me. Detachment is neither kind nor unkind. It doesn't imply judgment or condemnation of the person or situation from which we are detaching. Separating ourselves from the adverse effects of another person's alcoholism or addiction can be a means of detaching. This does not necessarily require physical separation. Detachment can help us look at our situations realistically and objectively. Addiction is a family disease. Living with effects of someone else's addiction is too devastating for most people to bear. In Al-Anon, we learn nothing we say or do can cause or stop someone else's addictive behavior. We are not responsible for another person's disease or their recovery from it. Detachment allows us to let go of our obsession with another person's behavior and begin to lead happier and more manageable lives with dignity, with rights, lives guided by a power greater than ourselves. We can still love a person without liking the behavior. In Al-Anon, we learn not to suffer because of another person's actions or reactions, not to allow ourselves to be used or abused by others in the interest of another's recovery, not to do for others what they can do for themselves, not to manipulate situations so others will eat, go to bed, get up, pay bills, not drink or behave as we see fit not to cover up for another's mistakes or misdeeds, not to create a crisis, not to prevent a crisis if it's in the natural course of events. And the last line says, by learning to focus on ourselves, our attitudes and well-being improve. We allow them, the addicts, the alcoholics in our lives, to experience the consequences of their own actions. Again, when the shit was hitting the fan, especially with my son and all of the stuff that was happening in his life that I wanted to change and fix and be different. I read that bookmark about a hundred times a week when it was so unmanageable. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the book, How Al-Anon Works for Families and Friends of Alcoholics, and read the section on detachment that's on page 83, chapter 11. Detachment is one of the most valuable techniques Al-Anon offers for those who seek to reclaim our lives. Simply put, detachment means to separate ourselves emotionally and spiritually from other people. If someone we love had the flu, canceling plans with us, most of us would understand. We wouldn't take it personally or blame the person for being inconsiderate or weak. Instead, in our minds, we would probably separate the person from the illness knowing that it was illness rather than our loved one that caused the change in the plans. This is detachment. And we can use it to see alcoholism or addiction or dysfunction in the same compassionate yet impersonal way. When the dysfunction or addiction causes a change in plans, 
or sends harsh words or other unacceptable behaviors in our direction, we needn't take it any more personally than we would if somebody had flu symptoms. It is the disease rather than the individual that is responsible. By seeing the person as separate from the disease, by detaching, we can stop being hurt by groundless insults or angered by outrageous lies. If we can learn to step back from the addict's symptoms and the effects, just as we would from a sneezing person with a cold, we will no longer have to take those effects to heart. How many of us have totally connected the person with the disease? And I know that I've talked to so many people who talk about how their loved one, when they're sober versus when they're not sober, is like two completely different people. And yet, it's really hard to separate, even though it's in the book and it makes it sound like you could treat it like the flu. I get that it's really hard in those moments when you have somebody who is acting in really painful, devastating, traumatic ways to separate out and see that person as a sick person, as if they had the flu, to recognize that they don't have control over this whatever it is in their life that is causing so much destruction. But if you can do the detachment, what it does is it stops the pain that you're receiving. It's almost like you can put a bubble around yourself. And when that negativity comes, you can ask yourself, am I going to let this in? Am I going to let this be something that hurts me? Am I going to allow the illness to be speaking to me and hurting me? Or can I keep that out and try to put the attention on myself and do what's right and healthy and the best for me in this exact moment to take care of myself and not need to change, affect, fix, control, make it easier or better or manage a crisis for this person who is ill. So that, I believe, is what it's asking for. It goes on to say, learning to detach often begins by learning to take a moment before reacting to the addict's behavior. In that moment, we can ask ourselves, is this behavior coming from the person or the disease? Although at first the answer may not be clear to us, in time it becomes easier to discern whether the addiction or our friend or relative has prompted the disturbing behavior. This distinction makes it easier for us to be able to emotionally distance ourselves from the behavior. We can remember that although alcoholics often surround themselves with crisis, chaos, fear, and pain, we need not play a part in the turmoil. I remember in a meeting having somebody say this idea that in the addict's world, it's like a whole movie that is filled with those things, crisis and chaos and fear and pain, and there's always something going on, and there's always some trauma happening and some excuse of something. Are we going to step into their movie? Do we have to play a role and be a leading part in their movie that they've chosen a storyline that doesn't appeal to us or doesn't feel like it resonates with us? Or are we going to watch their movie and observe it as if it is something from the outside? And that was really helpful to me because I could be so caught up in jumping into somebody else's storyline instead of staying in my storyline and observing and just being present for. It says, blaming others for the consequences of their own choices and acting out verbally or physically are some of the smoke screens that the addict can use to conceal the real source of trouble, their addiction. Again, we are trying to fix their addiction. We are trying to show them their addiction. We're trying to let them see that if they would just do something about it, they would do so much better. But we get gaslighted sometimes by how much they don't want to look at it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to do anything about it because they're so run by their addict. And so when we're fighting with them, we're fighting with the addict who is strong and powerful and determined to stay. 
And so we need to be cautious of not getting caught up in those smoke screens and knowing when we can connect and talk to the human being, when we're connecting and talking to the addict, what we're fueling sometimes when we're talking to the addict, and how we can reach and connect with the human being, and how in all of that, the first thing that we're doing is taking care of ourselves. This is not easy. It goes on to say, everyone's attention goes to the harsh words, the broken glass, the bounce check, rather than the disease, rather than the addict that is taking charge. It becomes automatic to defend against the insult, weep or rage at the thrown glass, scramble to cover the bounce check. But by naming the disease, we see through the addict's smokescreen and therefore needn't be distracted by it at all. We can look at their movie, right? We can really observe their movie. Instead of taking the behavior personally, in time we learn to say to ourselves, that's just addiction and let it go. That's the addict and let it go. Instead of taking it personally, we can't compete or fight against the addict. Addiction is so powerful. It is so intensely powerful and insidious. And we each have our own addictions. And if we're honest, control is a major addiction that I think most people have on some way or another. But as I've said so many times before, I couldn't stop drinking. No matter how much I wanted to at those times, my addict was so powerful and it ran my mind in an entirely different way. I'm an incredibly different person because I'm my whole person now. I am my true self now. And for so many years of my life, I was run by my addict. And so when you're dealing with somebody that is an addict, you can't compete against the addict. By not competing, you're allowing it to run its course and the person on the inside to know that that's the person you're fighting for. That is the person you're fighting for, is the one that's on the inside, the true whole person. And that if you can recognize and see them, maybe they can see and recognize themselves to want to do something about the addiction. I know that at some point I did. It says, simply knowing that addiction is the source of the unacceptable behavior isn't sufficient, however, we may have to take action to help us achieve greater emotional distance. We might change the subject, leave the room, or even the house, or involve ourselves in some physically demanding activity. We may need to support our of a sponsor or fellow Al-Anon member can provide. An Al-Anon call or meeting can be just what we need to help us separate ourselves from the symptoms and effects of the disease without separating ourselves from the human being. So we know that it can be so easy to want to hide what's going on for you and not share with other people and try to pretend like everything's great and my life is great and I'm perfect and there's no problems here. But the truth is that most of us, I have never met a single person who doesn't have something going on under the screen, behind the doors, under the blankets, whatever you call it. We're all human beings with issues and issues in our relationships, and issues in ourselves. We're all just trying to be better. So if you can find a place, which I hope Recover Your Soul is the place where you feel like you can be open and and safe and share, to find people who you can share your experience with. And this isn't about sharing your victim experience. This is about sharing your heart experience. This is about sharing your your personal feelings, what you're going through, not from a he did this, so I am this way, but I am working on this. These are the feelings that I have. Here's my experience. Here's what I'm learning. Here's how I'm becoming more courageous. Here's what I'm letting go. Here's what I need to let go. Those are powerful relationships. And if you're interested in doing that with me, 
I have my coaching business. I love how quickly people move forward in just a few sessions of really, really wanting to dig into self-responsibility and do soul recovery work. We also have the soul recovery support group starting in April, first Monday of the month. Go to the website and register to join us for a Zoom support group, a great way to connect. It goes on to say, at first, we may not detach gracefully. Many of us have done so with resentment, bitter silence, or loud and angry voices. It takes time and practice to master detachment. Beginning the process is important, even if we do it badly at first and must make amends later. But it is even more important to remember that establishing personal boundaries is not the same as building walls. I love this. Personal boundaries is not the same as building walls. It's not the same as saying that you don't care. It's not the same as as throwing up the middle finger and saying, I've had it with you. What it's about is not taking on their stuff anymore. Not allowing yourself to get caught up in the addict's movie, in those behaviors as if that is the person. It's about detaching from the need to fix and control and that we can do that with gentleness. And sometimes we have to do it with more severity. Some relationships need stronger boundaries, but it's not about not caring and it's not about putting our guard up. It's actually about opening ourselves internally even more. It goes on to say, our goal is to heal ourselves and our relationships with other human beings not to coldly distance ourselves, especially from the people who matter to us most. In fact, detachment is far more compassionate and respectful than the unfeeling distancing or the compulsive involvement many of us have practiced in the past. For when we detach with love, we accept others exactly as they are. It's the stopping changing people. It's the just letting people be themselves. And that isn't easy because we want to have lives that are connected. We want a husband who is more attuned to us. We want kids who aren't struggling so hard. We want partners who get us and want to do the things that we want to do in life. We want friends that are present for us. But when we can allow people to be themselves and put that focus on ourselves to heal us and be our best self, the choices that we make change, and the relationships that we have change, and the people around us respond to us differently, and that often the relationships that are the most painful for us have healing. When we can see people exactly as they are and stop trying to change them, they can have the strength to change themselves. It says, detachment with love allows us to hate the disease of addiction, yet step back from the disease in order to find love for the addict. For some of us, this love was apparent all along. For others, love may be the last emotion we would associate with this addict. Those of us who grew up in an abusive alcoholic or addictive environment may be hard-pressed to summon any love for the addicts we have known. That's the end of that chapter. That's, that's okay, too. I've worked so much with people whose lives were so profoundly affected by drugs and alcohol and behaviors that were not great in their childhood that this is a slow learning process. This is really a healing process that takes time. So the more gentle that you can be with yourselves in this step-by-step, day-by-day soul recovery journey the more it's going to come to you without that part of us that wants to judge us for how we're doing it. You're doing it just right. You're doing it exactly as it is meant for you because you are being guided by higher power. And when you can lean into your higher power and know that this work is the work of learning how to trust and have hope that you can come out of this that you can detach from those things outside of us that are causing you pain. 
those things outside of us that we don't have control of and begin to put the emphasis back on ourselves to grow our internal love and compassion and worthiness and feel that trueness of who we are within ourselves. You've got this. You've got this. I hope these two sections were helpful to you. If you, again, are interested in working with me, please get online and book a coaching session. However many works for you, there's no commitment, and it's amazing to see what happens so quickly. And if you want more book study stuff, get to Apple Podcasts and become a subscriber or a Patreon member so that you can get those bonus episodes. Thank you so much for supporting Recover Your Soul. You can always make a donation on the website. And if you give me five stars and higher reviews, it helps the algorithms for this to get out to even more people and spread the word of soul recovery. Thank you so much. Until next time, namaste. Thank you for listening. And I hope this episode offered you tools, guidance, and inspiration on your journey to recover your soul. If you'd like some support and encouragement with your soul recovery, book a coaching session with me. When you're ready for change, it's amazing what can be done in just a few sessions. There's never any long-term commitment. This is your personal journey, and I'm just here to be a guide and assist you in connecting with your fullest and happiest self. Visit the website, recoveryoursoul.net, where you can find more about me, Rev. Rachel, book your spiritual coaching sessions, subscribe to receive email updates, and even listen to some of my original music. We thank you for supporting the production of this podcast by donating on the homepage or subscribing on Apple Podcasts or becoming a Patreon member. When you become a member or a subscriber, you're going to receive an extra bonus episode each week, and your support is really appreciated. By following, subscribing, and reviewing this podcast on your favorite platform, you're helping to spread the Recover Your Soul message. We hope that you will follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and even join the private Facebook group to become part of our transformational community. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul.